Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida visited the Philippines, with plans to announce a security aid package and initiate negotiations for a defense pact. The visit aims to strengthen Tokyo's alliances amid rising concerns about China's assertiveness in the region, particularly in the South China Sea. The discussions between Kishida and Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. will focus on bolstering overall relations, with defense ties taking precedence. Japan's support for the Philippines comes after recent aggressive actions by China in the disputed waters. Kishida is expected to address a joint session of the Philippine Congress, emphasizing the transformation of ties since Japan's World War II occupation. The visit includes the launch of a Japanese security assistance program, with the Philippines as the first recipient, aiming to provide non-lethal equipment and infrastructure improvements. Both leaders are also anticipated to announce negotiations for a defense pact, allowing troop deployments for joint military exercises and security activities, serving as a deterrent to regional aggression. Japan and the Philippines have announced the commencement of negotiations for a defense pact that would allow the deployment of troops on each other's territory. The move is part of deepening defense cooperation between the two countries, aiming to counter China's growing military pressure in the region. The Reciprocal Access Agreement, once established, would provide the legal basis for sending defense personnel for training and other operations. Japan will also assist in enhancing the Philippines' maritime law enforcement capabilities, including providing patrol vessels and technology cooperation. The development reflects increased regional tensions and efforts by the United States, Japan, and their allies to strengthen alliances in response to China's assertiveness. The article discusses the potential challenges to the normalization of relations between Israel and Arab countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, due to the recent conflict in Gaza. The process of normalization, known as the Abraham Accords, began in 2020, but the recent violence has sparked protests in Bahrain, Egypt, and Morocco, putting pressure on leaders to reconsider diplomatic ties with Israel. While some experts believe that Hamas may have intended to disrupt the normalization process, there is uncertainty about how much carnage Israel can endure before Arab countries reconsider their diplomatic deals. The Biden administration is reportedly cautioning Israel about the repercussions of its attacks on Gaza and the potential fading of public support for Israel. Despite these challenges, there is still hope for diplomacy to prevail, with Saudi Arabia expressing a commitment to negotiations on normalizing ties with Israel and the UAE reaffirming its commitment to the Abraham Accords. The article discusses the dynamics between Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, and Mike Johnson, the new Speaker, as they navigate a $14 billion bill aimed at supporting Israel's defense against Hamas. Johnson, a Louisiana Republican, chose a conservative approach, defying Schumer's push for bipartisanship. Schumer criticizes Johnson's lack of bipartisanship and predicts that such an approach may not work. Johnson's strategy involves pushing conservative bills to establish trust within the GOP, while Schumer emphasizes the need for bipartisan cooperation, especially with critical deadlines approaching, including the risk of a government shutdown on November 17. The article highlights the potential challenges and tensions between the relatively inexperienced Johnson and the experienced Schumer in leading Congress through upcoming negotiations. The United Arab Emirates, UAE, has warned of a potential regional spillover from the Israel-Hamas conflict in Gaza. Despite being a prominent signatory of the 2020 Abraham Accords with Israel, the UAE acknowledges the strain on regional relations caused by the ongoing conflict. Noura al kabi a UAE Minister of State, emphasized the need to work towards a humanitarian ceasefire to prevent further escalation and the exploitation of the situation by extremist groups. The UAE, considering Islamist groups like Hamas a threat, supports efforts to protect civilians and end the conflict. The UAE is also working to treat Palestinian children from Gaza and is pushing for immediate humanitarian aid delivery. The statement comes amid rising concerns in the region about civilian casualties and Israel's actions in Gaza. The UAE's neighbor Bahrain, also an Abraham Accord signatory, announced the return of its ambassador from Israel, though the reason for the move was not explicitly stated. Celebratory scenes unfolded in Beirut as thousands gathered to watch a televised speech by Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, marking his first public remarks since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Nasrallah praised the recent Hamas attack on southern Israel, emphasizing its success and attributing it solely to Palestinian planning. The speech came after a significant escalation in clashes between Hezbollah and Israeli forces on the border, raising concerns about the potential for the Israel-Hamas conflict to escalate into a regional war. 
Despite Hezbollah's calculated actions to keep Israel's military engaged, the situation remains tense. In the midst of the Israel-Hamas conflict, Israel has intensified its strikes against Iran-backed militias in Syria, moving away from its previous policy of always warning Russia in advance of such attacks. This shift, along with increased assaults, has strained relations between Israel and Russia. There is now a risk of Syria becoming a new front in the Israel-Hamas war, heightening tensions in the region. Israel's recent strikes in Syria include a military base in Dara and weapons depot attacks, resulting in casualties. Israel did not notify Russia before these strikes, marking a departure from previous coordination efforts. The broader context includes rising tensions on Israel's borders with Lebanon, where daily exchanges of fire with Hezbollah occur. The situation adds complexity to an already volatile region, with potential implications for the ongoing conflict in Israel-Gaza. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel to meet with leaders, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as the U.S. advocates for a humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Blinken's visit aims to discuss Israel's right to self-defense, humanitarian assistance for Gaza civilians, release of hostages, and preventing the conflict from spreading. President Joe Biden also renewed the call for a humanitarian pause. Blinken's trip coincides with the departure of over 400 Americans and other foreign nationals from Gaza, marking efforts to address the humanitarian situation in the region. Russia launched its largest drone attack on Ukraine in a month, deploying up to 40 UAVs across 10 regions, with 24 drones and a cruise missile intercepted. The attack targeted various regions, including Kharkiv, Lviv, Odessa, and Dnipropetrovsk, causing fires in the Kharkiv region. The Ukrainian forces continued counteroffensive operations, and the conflict in eastern Ukraine remained relatively static. Meanwhile, oil prices headed toward a second weekly loss due to the contained Israel-Hamas war and emerging concerns about demand. Russian troops advanced marginally in Ukraine's east, and discussions on Russia's war in Ukraine took place during a video conference between German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Chinese President Xi Jinping. The focus remains on preventing a nuclear war. Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed that Western weapons supplied to Ukraine were ending up in the Middle East and being sold to the Taliban through the illegal arms market. Since Russia's intervention in Ukraine, Western powers have sent substantial military aid to Ukraine, raising concerns about the potential diversion of weapons. While Ukraine asserts tight control over the weapons it receives, Western security officials and Interpol have expressed worries about the possibility of weapons falling into the hands of organized crime groups. The Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime noted in a report that, although there is currently no substantial outflow of weapons from the Ukrainian conflict zone, there is a risk that Ukraine's battlefields could become a source of arms for various groups after the war. The United States and other Western donors have committed significant military aid to Ukraine, totaling at least 84 billion euros, 90 billion dollars, including artillery, vehicles, and ammunition. Dmitry Medvedev, the deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council, issued a stern warning to Poland in an article, labeling it a dangerous adversary of Moscow and suggesting the possibility of a loss of statehood. Medvedev's article, filled with Russian propaganda themes, included claims about Polish interests in Ukraine's western regions and accusations of Polish Russophobia. He also hinted at the potential for a military conflict involving Russia, Belarus, and Poland. In response, Polish State Secretary Stanislaw Zarin characterized Medvedev's article as a demonstration of hatred filled with threats against Poland and NATO. The timing of the aggressive rhetoric, amid Russia's engagement with Germany on energy cooperation in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, raises concerns about Russia's intentions and its attempt to reshape Europe's political and economic landscape. The painting Se Ararang, a Chinese art gallery, openly sells North Korean art in violation of UN sanctions prohibiting the sale of such goods. The gallery operates a studio for North Korean artists in the outskirts of Beijing, where glorified, idyllic visions of life in North Korea are painted. Despite UN sanctions targeting North Korean goods, including art, China's lax enforcement allows such galleries to thrive. Ararang actively seeks a niche audience drawn to the unique socialist realist style of North Korean artists. The gallery's existence highlights China's resistance to enforcing sanctions against North Korea to stymie its nuclear program. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen urged Bosnia to speak, with one voice, across its different ethnic groups to facilitate the country's progress toward joining the European Union. 
Von der Leyen emphasized Bosnia-Herzegovina's future in the EU and commended the progress made in the country's first year as a candidate. As the war in Ukraine continues, EU officials aim to advance the integration process in the Western Balkans and encourage necessary reforms. Bosnia, facing challenges like corruption and political divisions, remains at the back of the queue among EU hopefuls. Von der Leyen stressed the importance of Bosnia making resolute progress in democratic reform and unity. An alliance of Myanmar ethnic minority groups, including the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, MNDAA, the Tong National Liberation Army, TNLA, and the Arakan Army, AA, claims to have made gains in its offensive against the ruling junta. The group's report capturing dozens of outposts, four towns, and blocking vital trade routes to China in northern Shan state. The junta vows to launch counterattacks, and fighting has displaced over 23,000 people. Junta chief Min Aung Lang declares the military's intention to hit back against the biggest military challenge since seizing power. The conflict has also disrupted border trade between China and Myanmar, a crucial revenue source for the junta. Myanmar's military leader, Senior General Min Aung Lang, has announced plans for counterattacks against ethnic armed groups, including the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, MNDAA, and the Tong National Liberation Army, TNLA, which have seized towns near the Chinese border. The alliance, known as the Three Brotherhood Alliance, launched a coordinated offensive a week ago in the northern part of Shan State. The military acknowledged losing control of towns on the border with China, impacting cross-border trade. The conflict has displaced over 37,000 people in northern Shan State, obstructed transit routes to China, and damaged a vital bridge.